Software-defined networking is changing the dynamic between carriers and the vendor community as enterprises and operators converge. TI now has the pleasure of talking with one of the pioneers of SDN. Mart Martin Casado is the CTO of networking for VMware, and he's also the inventor of the open standard protocol commonly associated with SDN called OpenFlow. Also with us in the studio is John Jacobs. He's the senior vice president right here at the Telecommunications Industry Association. And Martin, first of all, welcome to the program. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. And John, thanks for being here, of course. Thank you. Talking about software-defined networking and its effect on the enterprise and on the carrier community as well. Martin, I want to start with you. Um, you know, these pieces always start out with asking, what is SDN and what's the mechanics of SDN? And we talk about the separation of the control and the data plane, the forwarding plane rather in the data plane. But I want to start this piece a little bit differently. I want to start with a quote by Sunil Kandekar, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. He's the CEO and founder of Nuage uh, Networks, and he said, this is what the CIOs and the enterprises care about. It's all about programmability and automation. That's how you bridge the gap between applications and the network. You make the network not stand in the way anymore, and you make SDN as consumable as compute has become, excuse me, and once that happens, you make SDN real. Martina, I want to start with you. What do you take away from that comment? Yeah, I, I think that's, that's largely correct, um, which is if you look directly at customers, particularly in the enterprise, SDN is about solving operational issues. Um, and so from a go-to-market perspective, that's exactly right. I think more broadly, what SDN is, is about evolving networking so it has a lot of the same properties of compute so that we can, it has the flexibility that we can apply it to many different types of problems, right? Those that are faced today by the enterprise, like what Sunil talked about, but then also um, uh, challenges that are going to be upcoming in many different areas as well. John, any takeaways from that? Well, I think that that's very instructive. Uh, you know, it's interesting coming from a, a carrier perspective, uh, watching the carrier's uh, ability to acquire and to uh, utilize this SDN technology is going to be is going to be fascinating, because uh, their their need to get a, a new angle on the enterprise customer and those verticals is really important for their success with those verticals. Historically, it's been a bit of an arm's length relationship. However, as you, as you use SDN to develop uh, or uh, enterprise specific apps, using the network, not uh, separate from the network, uh, that's gonna be uh, a real horse race as to who brings that innovation to the marketplace. John, of course, VMware is a new member of TIAs. They're moving markets in the SDN sector. They're offering new opportunities for carriers, um, new modes of revenue. Um, new business practices, and that has changed the relationship between the carrier operator and the vendor community. How's that culture changed pre-SDN and now? Uh, and you're absolutely right. VMware is a new member of TIA, and uh, we're, we're very happy about that. They bring, VMware brings a lot to the table uh, from their enterprise software background, and that is unique uh, to them in the, in the uh, family of TIA. Uh, so, you know, historically, the, the vendors or the manufacturers of the TIA community uh, have really focused on their network, on, the hard, on their hardware uh, principally, right? So better, faster, cheaper has been their, their model. But you can take that so far. Uh, and then with the advent of, of, uh, of software-defined networking, what you're seeing is, and we've got some, uh, some real uh, keystone examples in our membership of major OEMs, uh, where there is this marriage between innovators such as VMware uh, taking software technology and layering it and interlacing it with the hardware that our OEM uh, members have been producing reliably for many, many years. So it's a new type of innovation. And so uh, that gives the manufacturers a new angle to add value to the network operator. And so uh, VMware, amongst other companies, uh, and the OEMs themselves, who are putting more and more focus on apps development and SDN in their own labs, uh, are really uh, turning the corner on this. Martin, I want to talk to you about some real-world examples, uh, or use cases, rather, for software-defined networking technologies. Of course, we hear, again, about the mechanics behind SDN, but because it's uh, still in its infancy, if, if you don't mind that, uh, that description, um, can you give me a, a real-world use case right now of, of how to implement software-defined networking? Yeah, absolutely. So 
uh, at this point, it's pretty well known that there is a big, huge operational mismatch between compute and networking when it comes to infrastructure as a service, right? So uh, if you do a look at a number of um, infrastructure as a service or clouds globally, um, in order to provision a new tenant or provision a new workload or provision a new application, while compute can do this in seconds, it often will take the network days um, to be able to be provisioned. And the reason is that the provisioning model um, is very complex. You have to have a lot of operators. They've got to manage state. They've got to do change tracking. You've got to be very careful, right? And so one place where SDN has really come to bear and we're seeing you know, very tangible benefits is that with SDN, you can build network virtualization systems which provide the provisioning properties of the network, um, which offer provisioning properties of the network which are the same as compute. And so as you provision compute dynamically and flexibly in software, you can also provision all of the network services. And you can do this without requiring any special handholding. And you can do this all in a matter of seconds. And you know, the, the implications of this are quite vast because you know, the difference between a company being able to innovate um, today and innovating in, in two months can be the difference on, on being, having a su successful product, especially in these days of, of mobile. And so I think this is a very kind of you know, tangible, real, implemented um, uh, use case of, of SDN today. Martin, I'm going to transition to another topic. And I'm going to use another quote to, uh, to tee this up. Uh, Bill, Ga Bill Gates rather uh, famously said, people tend to underestimate the impact of technology in the long term and overestimate it in the short term. How will SDN benefit the industry in the short or long term as vendors try to differentiate themselves in an increasingly uh, commoditized environment? And I'm talking about hardware products. Yeah, so I mean, to me that, you know, you know SDN is about, like, you know, it's, it's part of a much broader journey of software you know, driving the model of computation. And we've seen this over the last, you know, 50 years, um, where more and more functionality is implemented in software. Um, and hardware provides as a service, as a, uh, you know, a, a generic pool for that software to run on top of. And, and, you know, this software can do anything, you know, for example, on the compute side or on the storage side and now on the networking side. And I think broadly, um, you know, it, because infrastructure is moving to software, you get all the benefits of software. You've got, you know, very fast innovation speed. Rather than waiting for an ASIC, which takes four years to build, you know, this is a matter of programming, which, you know, is very quick. You get the decoupling. You get all of the, 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 the flexibility and programmability of software, right? So this is part of a broader movement. Um, so I think, like, the near-term implications are that we can build better systems, right? I think the near-term implementations are, are primarily for systems builders. Like, if, like, you know, I'm at VMware. We build products for... Um, uh, uh, for customers, and the near-term implications is I can use SDN as, a, as an approach to build better systems. And the long-term implications are what happens from those better systems, right? The long-term implications are once these systems come to the fore, things like network virtualization, things like better security services, things like um, better traffic engineering services, once these things get created, then it changes an industry because now IT is consumed totally differently. John, companies like VMware are allowing their customers, carriers, the vendor community as well, to integrate themselves into new verticals and, and further into the verticals they've been working on over the last several years. Which verticals, in your opinion, will benefit the most from software-defined networking? Well, it's difficult to say. I mean, if you take the approach that the carrier is the customer, uh, then uh, it's really based on a few things. One is their speed of adoption of, of solutions. Of, and of the technology itself, but, uh, and I think Martin picked up on this and mentioned it, and, and this is a segue to actually the role of the CIO, and I'll come back on that point in a bit, uh, but, you know, innovating to the point of creating new products and services for vertical markets is very important. The company, the sectors that are highly tech dependent today are folks like healthcare, um, you know, some of the financial markets. Uh, but longer term, you see scenarios that follow the path of phenomenon like machine-to-machine uh, -machine technology, industrial automation. And I could, I could imagine having a massive impact on, on uh, uh, micro-manufacturing, as an example, where you're seeing product sets or SKUs being created in manufacturing environments, and that way having a much faster uh, adaptation of, of a network capability is going to help on the communications layer of those of those manufacturing. So I think you see it there. I, it's hard to say at this point. I would say healthcare is probably the closer in one. 
uh, because of their deployment of, tech, of technology, communications technology today for monitoring and, and for, in some cases, treatment. Martin, uh, of course, you know I, was, I wasn't going to skip over this. I want to talk about OpenFlow. Uh, many would agree that OpenFlow is an integral uh, part of SDN as it flips that old paradigm of proprietary protocols to open sourcing and, and open networks. Can you briefly explain what OpenFlow is and what's the current use of OpenFlow? Sure, yeah. So if you look at traditional software hardware decoupled models, you've got functionality written in software, um, and then you have an interface for that software to run on the hardware. And in order to have hardware independence, not, not necessarily vendor independence, but hardware independence, so the hardware can evolve on different time scales, you've got a standard interface. So you can run that, so write that software once and run it on multiple hardware platforms and let the hardware evolve, whether from the same vendor or different vendors. And so OpenFlow um, is an effort to provide this type of an interface between the, the control plane and the data plane, which is the standard interface that software can use to talk to the forwarding hardware. And some people uh, like to uh, draw an analogy with x86, right? So um, in the compute world, software gets compiled down to x86 instruction set, which gets run on processors. And it, the processor can evolve, um, but the instruction set maintains largely the same. And when it does evolve, it does in a backwards compatible way. OpenFlow is very much the same thing, which is you can write controllers. You can write control planes that talk OpenFlow. And therefore, even though the hardware evolves, um, and even the features of the hardware evolves, you can still make sure that your software can run on, 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 uh, on it and still control it. Martin, you're saying the idea originally behind open sourcing and open networking, open protocols, if you will, is to encourage further convergence in the ecosystem. Is that what you're trying to do? Uh, so I'm not trying to say convergence in the ecosystem, but what I'd say is horizontal integration, which is like good system design decouples um, uh, layers so that they each can evolve independently, right? So you want to have not only competition, but compatibility um, between all layers. And when you decouple things, it allows faster innovation speed. So for example, the technology used to evolve hardware is very different than the technology used to evolve software. And so if they're coupled, it would require, in order to evolve software, the hardware to evolve as well. So when we decouple things, not only does it allow us to innovate faster from a system design perspective, but it, already, but it also does horizontalize the industry, meaning that you can have multiple vendors for the hardware and multiple vendors for the software, which ultimately, um, I think, cr creates healthy ecosystems and is a big win to the customer. John, I want to talk, uh, get away from the technology uh, per se, uh, just for a moment, and talk about um, some other critical management and or or orchestration uh, layers that uh, will facilitate SDN to be adopted by the industry. What are some of those, uh, I guess, tangential uh, concerns? Well, so if you're, you're speaking of the carrier environment, uh, as for example, uh, the, the role of the CIO in this capacity with C S SDN development, uh, you know, you think about the CIO is really the only member of the executive team who can unlock real-time data of the network, right? And, and that's where the productization, the revenue uh, capabilities of SDN become real. So historically, a carrier is the CIO is not necessarily perceived as a product delivery uh, agent, right? But that's changing. And, and therefore, uh, organizationally, carriers have to be in a position to uh, embrace the CIO and perceive him or her as a, a front office uh, role, not simply monitoring, managing all the IT aspects of, of the company or the network. So that's, that's a real change of, of behavior that has to happen. Uh, and then, you know, historically, it carries often just the product marketing organizations that define value, whether it's for enterprise or consumer, and, and they look at the network folks as, you know, my goodness, uh, do I really have to talk to them because I want to move fast and, and, and furious in my own marketing way? Uh, but this changes that. This changes and put product, pr puts product innovation closer to the network, actually uh, directly in the hands of a CIO. So pulling him or her closer to the marketing organization and to the consumer, in this case the enterprise customer, is going to be really a test. Martin, back to you. Uh, when we were out in Silicon Valley, we had a, a lengthy conversation about the OpenFlow protocol and other competing protocols, and you were very, um, I guess, upfront about uh, your opinion about what you invented yourself. I want to quote um, 
R. P. Joshi Pura, and again, I hope I pronounced his name correctly. He's the head of product management and networking at Dell. He said it's not a question about an open flow protocol that some competitors are pushing out. It's about an open standard that we can migrate our customers from existing legacy infrastructures to the new SDN enabled networks. Would you agree with that? And, and why is that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually fair, which is, um, you know, the macro point here is that you want to have an open interface that allows software to drive hardware, and you want an ecosystem, both in the software and hardware side, to flourish around that. That is the macro level goal. And there's many ways to achieve this. As long as they have the right properties, everybody wins. So OpenFlow is the first, probably the most widely adopted, but it's certainly not the only way that you can do it. And so I think as long as we keep our eye on the objective, and the objective is innovation in software, horizontal integration, um, and a rich ecosystem, whatever mechanism ends up filling the void, we should all be very happy with. John, I want to quickly talk about the TIA 2013 conference uh, right here at the Gaylord National in Washington, D.C. It starts on October 7th through the 10th, correct? Yes. Um, I want to talk about how you begin to talk about a new technology in these educational tracks at the TI Now studio. How do you develop that content, that discussion, when there's so much reticence still to move to next generation technologies and to spend that additional capex? Um, how do you, I guess, I don't want really to use the word convince, but how do you begin to talk about that? Well, you know, and I, I don't think it's reticence, actually. I think there's a lot of expectation to continue to innovate. And, and the carriers know, and certainly the OEMs know, that their future is built on innovation. And to the point that Martine makes and that you're making, uh, adopting new types of technologies uh, to their game field, their, their playing field, is, uh, to their credit, they, they, they're willing to embrace it. It is true that uh, they have billion carriers have billions and billions of dollars of uh, uh, invested in legacy networks, right? So moving from PSTN to an all IP environment, uh, that is a uh, a big game changer for them, uh, and so that but that's been underway for a few years now. So the industry has been evolving, and 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 that's one example of that. The LTE move is another example for mobile network. Uh, so I don't think that's the issue as much. I think it's really about speed and knowing what types of products to put in, in, in place for verticals, right? Particularly for enterprise, again. So I think that's where you're seeing these planning horizons a bit extended. So that's essentially where we are now. Martin, I want to ask you one final question before we go and close out this segment. And again, once again, I appreciate you being with us. I want to ask you uh, on a scale of one to 10, one being the worst, 10 being the best, what your comfort level is right now with the adoption of, of SDN technologies? Um, I mean, given the maturity, um, I would say I'm at an eight, which is, you know, we're seeing you know, these concepts largely came out of work that happened in 2007. Um, there's a bunch of R&D that one happened. Products have only been available for a couple of years, and we're actually seeing a huge uptake in them. And so, I mean, I think that we're on the knee of the curve. So my, 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 my confidence is fairly speculative, but I would say, like, early signs are great. And I think that the, the, the acceleration um, uh, is a great indicator that we're, we're hitting an inflection point. So highly confident based on early signs, but with the admittance that this is still early and, and, and fairly speculative. Martin, uh, once again, we appreciate you uh, spending some time with us. We know that your schedule is busy, as we all are, uh, but I had a chance to talk to you just a, a month ago, and I, I've seen your schedule. So we appreciate your time. And John, of course, uh, thanks for making it uh, into the studio and talking with us. Once again, TIA 2013 will be held from October 7th through 10th, that at the Gaylord National right here in Washington, D.C. The SDN workshops will be held on October 7th from 1 to 5 p.m., and on the 8th at 8.30 to 10.25 a.m. For more information about the conference tracks and workshops, please go to TIA2013.org. So long.